Um, a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I've been a development director uh, with the Nike Plus team for the last couple years. Moved, us through, uh, moved with us through several transformations in the development process, which we'll go over here. And just recently moved into the tech ops team with a database group so we can really lift ourselves into the NoSQL technologies and make them a real product uh, enabler. So the game lights are on, glaring in my face. Uh, it must be go time, so let's get right down to it. So taking us back to 2011 when I uh, jumped into the group, uh, I sat down in a conference room and was, was welcomed with a welcome to Code Red. I had a service that was barely running in production. We had built a very popular running and activity service on top of what amounted to an agency concept vehicle. Uh, we had servers that wouldn't start reliably. We had uh, lots of uh, blocking issues and a couple of the key ones were already identified. Um, very little automated test and validation code. <clears throat> What's cool about this is within three days of joining the group, I was able to put out a software fix, update it, get production stable enough to then start to, start to move forward. Uh, really fast deployment cycle. Uh, we would, uh, after that, kind of slow it down a little bit, get things sane. So characterization, as I go through our journey here, uh, characterization of 2011, the early days. Uh, validation was haphazard, uh, manual, based on specific features in a, in a shared environment with lots of developers kind of dumping into that environment. Some of you may have experienced something like this. Uh, we had uh, our in-house product understanding at the time was, was pretty low. Uh, deployment quality poor. Ne nearly every release contained uh, escape defects, either that we knew about beforehand or, or that uh, we were learning for the first time in production. Engineering work cycles were about 24-7, and uh, time to deploy new features was months, and if we're honest with ourselves, probably never uh, in the way that at least they were intended. So we knew we had to change. Uh, something that's really cool about Nike is we're always very excited to evolve immediately. You'll see a very quick transformation over the years that has led us into the microservices. So 2012, uh, we have our own back end. It's game time on the 50 yard line, ready to go. Uh, we, we moved into a deep tech, deep vertical tech stacks, seemed like the thing to do at the time. Uh, adopted a universal mentality to supporting multiple apps. Uh, we effectively uh, built ourselves a monolith. We had expensive technology, uh, well-known public standards, uh, and we were still operating with about nine uh, distributed development teams in the same code base supporting uh, about 14 different products. Uh, we, we were operating off of about a three-week development cycle. Um, of that three weeks, we probably got two days of honest, honest development time. And the rest of the time was bringing all these, st bringing everything together from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the nine different development teams, putting them all in a pot, shaking them up for about 15 days before we felt strong enough to send it out to production. And that, that, that wasn't, we weren't yet at a good place to be, I'd say. So 2012 uh, characterizes kind of a startup development cycle. We had a lot of JUnit and JMeter, brought ourselves a bit more consistency there. Uh, coverage requirements, but the, the tests themselves were inconsistent. Uh, In-house product understanding was now pretty high. Uh, we, after all, we developed it ourselves. Development quality was okay. Uh, we still had intense manual validation required, um, and this led to many, many date misses. Engineering work cycle still near 24-7. A lot of time spent in stabilization whilst we uh, tried to get after the next sprint worth of work. Uh, engineering work cycle uh, with that being still around 24-7. Uh, time to deploy new features. We had gotten, gotten a little better on that, months, months to quarters. And from a product perspective, uh, it looked like we were moving fast, and we were certainly moving around a lot, uh, but still a bit chaotic in our, in our delivery. So bring it to 2013. Let's bring in some core principles. Uh, we reorganize ourselves around uh, security and privacy, around, uh, in order, by the way, security and privacy, uh, reliability, availability, maintainability, performance, and then features. Features is what we get paid for, but you gotta get all that stuff right, otherwise it's not a real delivery, right? 
So 2013, I'll call this our get to green. Uh, at Nike, we're, we're fond of setting a daily goal, uh, getting your Nike fuel to reach that goal continuously. So I'll use that for this characterization. At this time, we're, we've moved to about 400,000 lines of code, uh, about one and a half million lines of test code through our various suites. Uh, pairwise development and TDD, we've pulled that in and started to learn and really own that. Our pull request process, uh, moving over to Git stash repo, all of a sudden enables 100% uh, peer review, where sometimes when you're, when you're not in a system that kind of enables that, you, you might pay a little bit of lip service to your peer review, especially when it gets to hundreds and thousands of lines of code. This, uh, this really helped us uh, solidify things. Our development cycle, uh, we, we got several days back for development and moved in our three-week cycle uh, to about five to 10 days of developing, um, 10 days towards the end here, and uh, moving to just about a week of uh, stabilization and deployment prep. Uh, we, we developed, as you might imagine, uh, very strict deployment processes, pulled in lots of people from lots of different organizations to kind of keep our risk managed and, and keep it sane, and uh, reduced down to about three parallel development efforts who are then able to move faster because we're operating in this, in this Git environment. So 2013, lots of tech debt repayment. Uh, validation, uh, we really put a hard focus on our validation cycles, get them reliable, get us some velocity back, move in small increments. J unit, J meter, automated and uh, mostly uh, consistent. Our in-house product understanding is now very high. Uh, now I don't have players moving in lots of different independent arenas uh, all trying to come together at the same time. And uh, deployment, deployment quality uh, moved to stable with the intended feature sets and bug fixes. Uh, engineering work cycle is now what I would call sane. Um, I won't quantify that too much further, but it's a, it's a good, uh, good work week now. Uh, time to deploy a new feature was weeks, and, uh, weeks to months. And from a product perspective, uh, we're stable, but, but we're kind of slow. And working for a company like Nike, uh, innovation is our is our name, uh, that's, that's uh, not, not as an acceptable of a place to be. So uh, that brings us to the now. Uh, we, uh, the motivation behind our, our uh, moving to microservices. So one of the first meetings I had with our, at the time, new Vice President of Development, Wilf Russell, uh, as I was describing the beauty of some of the technology stack that we were employed in our development process and um, the, the amount of controls that we had in place and kind of the, the product we were able to move forward, he, he looks at me and just says, free your mind. And so uh, we've taken that, taken that to heart and uh, reflected upon our, our three plus years of development and really uh, to transform us into moving to the microservices. Key observations from, from our past. Configure man configuration management was still delaying our software cycle. We still weren't getting it right, uh, key to some of the reliability issues we had during the testing and dev cycle. Database deployments were still manual. Um, even small changes uh, still had unintended consequences. Uh, we, we caught those before production now because we had a good test cycle, but that was really slowing us down uh, it, as far as getting, getting stuff reliably to production. Uh, still moving too slowly, as we said in a couple slides previously. Uh, and then uh, started developing the mantra just from on reflection that normalization is indeed the root of all evil. Uh, for a high availability, high scale uh, kind of a deployment, we really started to, to embrace uh, multiple copies of data and services for that matter. Uh, we also reflected upon the huge organizational approval. So we pulled everyone in to, to manage our risk profile and make sure that we could reliably get something to production every two or three weeks, um, but that, that comes at a cost. Enter microservices. So uh, some of the key uh, learning points I'll, I'll share with you here and jump into just a couple patterns, um, hopefully to help you uh, move faster uh, in, into your own journey into this. So we, we pulled up the Phoenix pattern and really took to heart the immutable uh, deployment units. Uh, built on uh, the AWS AMI instances and EC2, uh, deployed to VPCs, uh, and then using a couple um, deployment and build technologies to, to really make it go. 
Uh, we, we really adopted the share nothing concept, uh, making sure that we're doing proper SOA uh, development and moving us into separate denormalized data sets, uh, really customized and specific for uh, the delivery of a service that, that uh, we, we needed. Consumer experience flows uh, is what we started to transform our thinking into. I had many, many times over the last several years where I'd have a mobile developer or a product owner come to me and ask for a, a feature. Uh, I, want a, I want a new service, and it's got to have all these 40 different non-related things jammed into it, because I want to call you once, and I want to I get all this so I can draw my screen. And then maybe I'll draw a couple screens off of it. So we've converted that kind of end-to-end -end implementation, as I'm calling it here, into really the customer experience flow, where we as platform, uh, platform service providers want to enable cool experience flows through very uh, nice, tight, uh, implemented domains that, where the experience flow becomes a composition on top of the services that, you, that you've implemented. So that's been a real, a real key learning for us, and I'll share some, uh, an example walkthrough of this. Uh, then continuous delivery. So we picked up a lot of practices, uh, transforming ourselves from a lot of the agile practices we have had further into kind of uh, some of the continuous delivery practices, uh, making small changes, reducing your risk profile, enabling us to really trust the developers and, and engineers that, that work with us uh, to, to get things to production rapidly and continuously, really to help us uh, move, move fast. <clears throat> I'll put a quick disclaimer in here right now, aside from the life is not perfect. Uh, the, we are on our journey, and uh, some of the services that, we're, that I'm talking about uh, will be hitting, hitting production a little bit later, but sharing some lessons learned as we get there and uh, as, we, as Nike continues to transform. So life is not perfect. I still have to integrate with the existing legacy systems. I still have to work with this monstrous, uh, maybe monstrous is the wrong word. I still have to work with the large organizational approvals and the process that we've used to uh, really help us manage our risk. Uh, we have reduced our need for, uh, for massive notifications, really taking a webhook style approach um, and uh, direct service to service notification uh, and responsibility. But there's still uh, some, some notification that makes sense. And then uh, we, we needed to look at everything that we had shared and really start migrating into a new, uh, a new world of applications that required us to actually build some new applications in the process. So now let's look at some of the patterns. So I've listed a set of technologies and um, some other bits that we'll walk through uh, around getting to production fast. So at, at the root, uh, we still have our DNS domain, api.nike.com. And I want to integrate into that uh, in a way that still enables my, my development teams to start to really experience the continuous delivery uh, fill. So what uh, we chose to do here, um, mileage may vary uh, for others, but what we've chosen to do here is in our API gateway, we've implemented a wildcard policy that pushes everything that we intend on, under, the new, uh, under the new domain model and the new uh, design model uh, into a single master Zool. So we picked up a uh, nice uh, technology nugget from uh, Netflix, uh, the Netflix OSS stack, and put that in place. What was really cool about that is I could turn it on, implement roughly three classes, and I'm grossly uh, simplifying a, a bit, um, but implement roughly three classes, and, and we're done. I have a system that I can now, uh, when a request comes in, do a Eureka lookup, see that I have an application registered for that, and then hand it off down to the next Zool layer. There are some issues you might see with this. This, this kind of violates our share nothing um, uh, policy, but it was a, it, it's turning out to be a great integration pattern to uh, kind of gracefully get us off of uh, the monolith. So second layer of Zool, then for the, just finishing out kind of the, the design on this, we drop down to the API Zool domain, uh, API domain Zool, which then implements our public API around the uh, well-designed uh, cohesive uh, domain, and then that passes off into microservices, where we use a lot of CQRS pattern, the command query responsibility segregation. And uh, this, this, what, what this effectively does is when I have a developer 
and a quality management engineer ready to push something to production. It's immediately available. I don't have any DNS wait time um, to, to hit the services all the way from at the consumer level. Uh, just walking down the technology stacks uh, we're using here. So obviously we're playing with AMI and relying heavily on ASG, particularly for that master Zool, where I'm gonna end up needing to scale up and down based on our traffic patterns. Uh, we've uh, been able to, really been enabled by the AWS console uh, in combination with the conformity monkey and another Netflix, Netflix OSS uh, Asgard uh, component. Um, combining those together is uh, we've, we've uh, applied several custom properties in order to enable um, billing, for lack of a better word, uh, ability to track across our organization how we're using it, which then lets us completely turn it on for, uh, for folks like mentioned in the keynote and just um, really let people uh, explore as, as necessary uh, when, when we have new ideas, new innovations spring to the forefront. And then for the dynamic discovery, that was a big one for us. Uh, I, I, was, I was very excited to, to really move into a dynamic discovery world. And uh, to do that, we used Eureka in combination with Ribbon. And then um, Arceus on the, on the uh, deployment help from a config management perspective. So that's, the, that's, our, that's our get to production fast. This, when we come here next year, uh, we, we may have a different set of technologies, but this, this has really, really helped us move uh, into, into a getting good starting point. So next, I talked a little bit about a notification pattern. So I'm a big fan of, of reducing uh, big uh, message buses uh, whenever and however possible. Um, just the number of places that you end up needing to manage that config and keep it tight and test it and validate is, is, gets a little ridiculous, uh, as I'm sure we, others have experienced. Uh, but we did, we did want to keep, uh, the, keep the ability to implement kind of a universal notification pattern. And what we moved to, and we're in conjunction with the AWS team that was working with us at, and the APIs themselves, uh, is we moved to a combination of the Amazon SNS services and the Amazon uh, SQS services. So what we will do to get around the, the primary issue that I at least have with uh, I implementing these service buses of having to manage, manage um, application settings at multiple levels at the same time, what we did is we gave sport, gave, in this example, we're using the sport activity service gave the responsibility of managing the topic uh, effectively to the sport activity service. And then because of the interaction between SNS and SQS with the registrations, we can now let clients come in on top of that topic, register uh, as, as they need to get, to get the events that are coming out of uh, this published system. And so that, that gives a nice segregation of responsibility where we can keep to a shared nothing uh, kind of a feel uh, without, without destroying the ability to uh, really do a useful publication service. And so in this example, I have my sport activity service. So at, uh, with Nike Plus, we, we get activity uploads. People go for a run, uh, daily, track their fuel daily, uh, play a basketball game. Uh, we, we take all that information in, uh, process it, and then uh, currently we're send it, we'll, we'll send it out to an SNS topic. And the services that we're building as we migrate away from the monolith <coughs> To consume that data will we'll come in with their own uh, SQSQ and, and use the API to go ahead and process those changes as they come in. Really gives us a, ni a nice clean separation. So third example, third uh, kind of pattern to go through. I'm going to walk through uh, a legacy service. And so one of, one of our services out there, uh, this is staying, staying within the theme of activities. I've got plus v1 me activities ID, uh, uh, a unique user ID. What this is, is it's an, it provides detail behind one of our activities that's out there running in production right now, and some a snapshot of the JSON that it returns uh, show an activity with activity ID, uh, acts fast in this case, uh, fuel points of 40, uh, we've got a daily goal embedded in there showing our progress, how close are we to meeting our target. You can draw some cool things on the, on the front ends with that. 
Uh, we, we also return the user data, so who, who sent this up, and uh, we return a device. And in this case, we're looking at a GPS watch. Some interesting observations just based on our lessons learned around this is we have a lot of information there that is really not related to activity. <clears throat> so we, we're always sending back daily go. We're always sending back the uh, user data. And we're always sending back devices where they're tangentially related but not specifically. So what we would end up with in this case is, is we end up with random bugs. If, you're, if your front end ends up locking onto name for user data, and if I've uh, bubbled that up through uh, like a message transformer, um, and then I make a, a court, uh, an under the covers change to user data, all of a sudden this and about 100 other uh, services that we have out there change, giving, giving uh, just wacky application crashes. So kind of motivation to move away from this. Uh, what we did is we took this model and we really broke it up. So we want to break anything that's shared, uh, keep consistent with uh, normalization being the root of all evil, and uh, move this out into four different uh, cohesive domains. So in our, um, our example, and it, uh, this, this doesn't reflect exactly the designs that we're using right now, but this is uh, an exemplar of, of what we've been doing across our domains. Uh, so we broke this out into an activity, uh, a device, your daily goal, and your user data. And then gave, gave them their own endpoints. So now I have plus activities, plus devices, plus goals, plus users, with little snippets of what they would contain, basic IDs and uh, any information relevant to that domain, and only relevant to that domain. And then we take a couple of those examples. So if I, if I walk into the, the activity uh, example, I have a command cluster, uh, a process cluster, and a query cluster that we built following the CQRS pattern. So, and translating that directly down in the, into the database level, uh, in this case, we're using Cassandra with the column families. I've got an optimized uh, for write, only really paying attention to the ID uh, column family to pull in from the command cluster, and then some optimized column fam uh, families to work uh, with the query cluster. And then we use some various process um, process clusters, and, and uh, we've split up some of the command clusters in actuality uh, to, to really work directly and le let us harden and scale our application. And what this does for us is this, this enables us to move um, really fast uh, independently uh, within this domain and not have to worry about breaking some other part of the experience. So doing the same thing against user data, I've got our command cluster and our query cluster. Uh, all auto scale groups uh, working against the, the customized database clusters um, for, uh, to really deliver uh, the quality service that we, that we need, uh, conforming to the, our, our development principles. So what are some client benefits of this uh, type of engagement? Well, first, uh, the client now gets to ask for the information they need. So as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're concerning ourselves with activity data in our, in our end goal and not user and goal. Reduce our bugs by not having to collate that information together and uh, gets, gets the, the client a bit faster access pattern. Our processes in the future and our, our uh, products in the future will, uh, as, we move, as we move through this migration into microservices, uh, will be collections of lots and lots of services being hit, uh, very fast response times to give the clients really what they want, sitting within the compositional access pattern that we're implementing. So on the user side, you can still create, uh, create custom no-logic composites. And in fact, we're doing this in some cases where it makes, where it makes sense. We'll, we'll draw a couple domains together and implement for a specific use case uh, the gathering of that data to overcome any kind of network latency issues. Uh, clients are able to effectively cache or just use the really fast service. So in a lot of cases, the service is implemented in this way uh, and keeping uh, an eventually consistent perspective on it uh, are able to deliver, uh, deliver in time not to need a cache. But now if, I, if I'm a client and I have some user data and I'm going to show that on six different screens, 
I will, I, I'm able to pull that in, cache that, and then use, use my activity service, have it related to my activity service, my goal service, or wherever that, uh, that data is going to be drawn together. But I put that in the hands of the client at this, at this point. Uh, scaling concerns, as I uh, briefly mentioned, uh, now don't cross functional boundaries. So when, when, I, when I need to, when, I, when my activity service gets more popular, when we run a marathon uh, in whatever part of the world that we're running a marathon, I, I now don't have to consider what that marathon with the uploaded activity is going to do to my profile service, which cares about login, login and registration. Now I have them completely broken out, and it's, it's a good place to be. Uh, simplified domains do not require one-off business logic. So this is a big one uh, for me. Uh, it's common sense when you, when you look back on it. Uh, it's taken a bit of a journey to get there. But what, what, when, when you look at any one of these domains now, you, you are no longer tempted to, to go in there and really give a one-off justification for a new app that came out. And that additional bit of uh, maintenance and tech debt that you, that you build into the system it, it completely goes away. So hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully those patterns were somewhat useful to you. We've I've just picked uh, picked from a from a set. These were kind of the key observations and uh, moving forward points that that uh, we were, we were at right now. And what that's gotten us into is 2014. We're just stepping into continuous delivery uh, for real. Have a couple of deployments that have started in the last few weeks, and those those are really going to pick up. Um, over the next year as we, as we move farther uh, into, this, into this breakdown. So we've got about 15 projects out there, which uh, before would have been just insane to consider uh, in the kind of uh, in the uh, monolithic world. Each one of these projects is really neat. So uh, going down from close to half a million lines of code, now I'm dealing with two, 700 to 2,000 lines of code using some of the, the products and technologies available through AWS and from um, from Netflix and uh, a lot of the other uh, providers in the open source community out there. 700 to 2,000 lines of code is something that's manageable. You can read through it as a developer and understand it uh, in, in an hour or so. So uh, this, this puts us in a completely different light with our ability to, to move forward quickly. Uh, developers plus quality engineers are, are able to take, uh, take changes all the way to production. I can now sit inside a, or in a scrum planning, so we, we follow scrum practice uh, mostly. Um, I can now sit in, sit in a scrum planning session, decide what our priorities are, uh, make the decision right there with project management, with, um, with the release management process and our developers saying, and our product owners uh, saying, hey, I want to do this feature. Well, now, uh, after I've broken it down, so one, one thing that we've done with this is we've taken it, uh, taken it down to one or two days of work for any given, any given piece of work. If something fills more than that, we, we put a lot of discipline right in that planning phase of, of breaking that down farther. But once you have that, now I can take that, and it's going to show up in that week. It's going to be the engineer and the, and the uh, quality management uh, professionals that, that I've paid to, <laughs> to, to really work, uh, work in this. It's going to be they're, they're here to work with us and make things go. Uh, it's really rewarding and fulfilling to then be able to actually transform from that product ID, uh, idea into actual production uh, within the same week, within the same day. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, ability to work on and complete priority of the day. Uh, that, I summarized that before. Um, and we've uh, transformed into more of an open source feel. So with, uh, with, lines of, with 700 to 2,000 lines of code in a given project, it's real easy for another team uh, to pick, pick up what they need and run with uh, one of the 15 projects that were there, or um, we'll probably move into the hundreds of projects uh, before too long here. Um, so that's, that's been really nice. And we've just been able to start to move at zero downtime high scale using uh, some, of the, uh, some of the technologies both uh, strung together with in AWS and in Netflix OSS, and that's that's interesting. We so currently in our in our monolithic system, I was pretty excited when I got to move us down from a three week to a two week delivery process. Um, very exciting, but in that process, I'm still taking the platform down for two or three hours, and our, all of our tracking is set up to uh, kind of gracefully ignore that period of time. 
with moving, moving us into this continuous delivery using uh, the technology, being able to do this in the period of, really transform ourselves in the period of a few months, um, and then really paying attention to this. We've been really excited to uh, impact our consumers uh, much less than what we're, we've been doing on the, on the monolith. So 2014 uh, characterization, got uh, continuous delivery. Uh, validation is 100% for automated, 100% uh, automated per project. Uh, we don't move forward uh, unless we have a test. We were able to check that with our uh, Git repository pull request. In-house product understanding uh, stays very high, actually gets extremely high. Uh, deployment downtime, uh, now we can achieve zero downtime with well understood impact, given that I'm only taking something we've been working on for a few hours to a couple days and pushing it. Uh, engineering work cycle is, is sane and, uh, and rewarding, because now, uh, now we as developers are able to get, get what we need out to production, which is fantastic. Uh, time to deploy new features can be hours, uh, bug fixes, uh, uh, new features, whatever, depending on the size. And from a product perspective, uh, we're just uh, starting to realize uh, my VP's statement of free your mind. So our product team is now starting to see what we're able to do and really bring a lot more to the forefront where we might have squashed it uh, in the innovation cycle up, up, up to that, knowing what we would have had to, uh, to do to get it out in production. So we've only just begun. Uh, shared nothing has really enabled us to move forward quickly. Uh, that, I, I think I've said that four or five times, but I, I can't emphasize that enough. The getting, getting your data and getting your services into cohesive domains uh, for us has, has, has really enabled us to just, just fly uh, through the development process and we're just, learning, we're just learning how quickly we actually can move. I, I expect this year to be very, very fun and exciting. Uh, AWS enabled our exploration and pro uh, production hardening. So we've uh, been able to use uh, the technologies available with the VPC and management uh, in the EC2 clusters and then a lot of the storage uh, systems. Uh, it's been really fantastic. I have a lot of uh, great things to, to say about, about that and I'm really actually looking forward to some of the new tech that was announced in the keynote this morning. Uh, Netflix OSS uh, really provided us a jump start. Um, it, we've, uh, with any with any technology you use, there's 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 a lot of really good things, and there are some things that that you learn as you go along the way. But uh, for us, that really was a uh, enabler uh, for us to get here as quickly as we did. And <clears throat> just to uh, continue to reinforce, we're we're on a journey. So Nike, we like to evolve immediately. Um, we're on a journey to rebuild our services to be horizontally uh, scaling, microservice based strong API contracts, um, and that's, that's uh, really what we're about now. So I'll let you read this one, if you wanna help. Nike is, uh, has made digital technology uh, a top priority for the company, digital development and, and uh, product usage. It's what, our, it's what our consumers expect. All right, and if that was exciting to you, you want to you want to learn more, uh, please join us at the pub crawl. We'll be at, let's see, we're at the Rock House. There's going to be a mechanical bowl. You can really show us your stuff. <laughs> and what's really cool about it is you'll be able, able to experience just a taste of the innovation, energy, and excitement that I get to work with every day at Nike. Um, and uh, we'll. We've, we've got that uh, bar decked out, really excited. Uh, it'll be fun to, uh, fun to have you join. And that is uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much, and please do provide feedback.